the six venomous snakes of South Carolina. Today we're going to talk about the minis. We're going to talk about the little pygmy rattlesnake and the coral snake. Fangs in your face. Subscribe now. What's up, Venom Squad? Hey, today we're going to continue our series on the six venomous snakes of South Carolina. And today we're going to talk about the minis, okay? The little squirts, <laughs> the little pygmy rattlesnakes, which we've got them here. And we're going to also talk about coral snakes. And I normally don't like to do a, a video on a species unless I have it at hand, if I've got one to show you. And we don't have a coral snake, but we've got a lot of interesting facts on coral snakes. And I'll tell you why we don't keep coral snakes when we get to that topic. The six venomous species of South Carolina, okay? And South Carolina is a reptile-rich environment. We have our cotton mouths and copperheads, which are your keisterdon species. We have the, the crowless, the big croats, of course the Eastern Diamondback and the Canebrake Rattlesnake. And then we have our little pygmy rattlesnakes and our coral snakes, which will be our topic today. I want to say a special thank you to all of our contributors to the Serpent Center and all of our supporters. We are on our way. We are very close to opening and we'll make the big announcement soon. And we're still working on exhibits and things are coming along nicely. And I know everybody's excited to get here and see the Serpent Center firsthand. And we are excited to meet you all and get open. It's been hard work every day, all day long, let me tell you. But we're close. We've had a few hiccups along the way. But hey, nothing's stopping this train from rolling. Hey, well, I know you all are probably thinking, why isn't Willie talking about this new legislation. I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole in this video. There's a lot of other, a lot of other YouTubers doing it. A lot of other, a lot of other people doing it. And you're bound to get a lot of misinformation. It is a federal bill, the America Competes Act. There are some amendments slid onto it that are part of the Lacey Act. If this passes, it will affect us as a facility. We will not be able to move our animals that we breed for Venom Labs over state lines. It will affect a lot of, a lot of people. Basically, the only thing that's not going to affect you if you want a cat or a dog. And sooner or later, it may affect that. Who knows? Get the right information. USARP.org. Give it to you straight, okay? Read the right information. The thing that I want to stress about this is that supporting USARP is great, okay? It's a wonderful thing. But joining USARP is a different thing, okay? Joining USARP you become part of this army. You become part of this community. And that's important. Because, say, when Phil and the other lawyers go to fight this kind of legislation, they can walk in there and say, you know, well, we, rep we represent 1,500 members of USR, and, you know, legislators can look at it like, so? But when they can walk in there and say, you know, we represent 200,000 people here in the United States that belong to our organization, and we want answers, that makes an impact. There's strength in numbers. We need numbers, okay? That's the big deal. That's why I stress everybody to join USR. It's $40. That's peanuts. Do it. Get the right information. USARC.org. Get it. Get it now. Jump on it, guys. Help me in this battle. We're going to get right with it, y'all. And we're going to jump in and start with our pygmy rattlesnake. Okay, we're going to start off with the little pygmy rattlesnake, okay? And, and just a little background up with me and pygmy rattlesnakes. I love little pygmies. I actually spent several years doing nothing but studying Cistaris, the Cistaris species of rattlesnakes, which are your little pygmy rattlesnakes and your Massasauga rattlesnakes. I did a lot of field work and stuff with the Eastern Massasauga rattlesnake when I was living in Ohio. The pygmy rattlesnake, this, and this is a squirrely one. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to. This little booger here, <laughs> that is your little pygmy rattlesnake. This is actually, this is a hybrid pygmy, okay? And I'm gonna set him down in here. We'll film him in here <laughs> instead of me trying to hook him and chase him around. But the thing is, is this little guy is, is a captive born animal and he is a hybrid of a Cistaris malarius barbari, which is your dusky pygmy rattlesnake, and a hybrid with 
a western pygmy rattlesnake, your Cystaris malarius streckeri, okay? And he was kind of an accidental birth in captivity. Somebody had an exhibit set up with, with two species of pygmy in it, and they had babies. So I got a couple of them, and I raised them up from the day they were born. And he's cute, ain't he? But, okay, let's try to get him to sit still for a minute. Dean would be chasing him around with the camera. Now, this is actually a widespread little critter here in South Carolina, um, especially in the southern portions of South Carolina. We have... We have what we call the um, the Barbari or, or or the the South Carolina form of dusky pygmy rattlesnake, and then as you get up into upstate a little further, we have what we call the Malaris Malaris, the actual Carolina pygmy rattlesnake, and they all look very similar, but their colors vary. I mean, I mean, I used to breed these things in mass quantity. I I I, I love pygmy rattlesnakes and the Hyde County pygmy rattlesnakes. They're actually brick red they're beautiful and i unlocked a lot of stuff about them little red pygmies and um we had it down to a science getting them babies eating and getting them started and 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 i'll tell you the trick with baby red pygmy rattlesnakes is little red backed salamanders they eat them up like popcorn now our pygmy rattlesnakes here in the great state of south carolina they're they're very spotty they like certain habitat okay they kind of like pine forested things that borders water sources. They really like water sources, little canals, things like that. But palmetto forest, um, pine forest, they like it a little drier, higher, but they like sandy substrate also. But it's not uncommon to see them swimming. These guys will take to water. They're, 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 they're pretty tough little boogers and they're cheeky. Let me tell you, they've got a really neat little defensive posture they do. They'll get in kind of a, a half-hearted coil, and you'll notice their heads start twitching like this. They start bobbing that head around. That's when they're getting really angry, and they're getting ready to pop you, okay? And the rattle. The rattle is so tiny that you can barely hear it. And a lot of times, that little tiny rattle falls off, and it's gone, and, and you don't even see a rattle. But like this little guy, he's got a teeny little rattle. And I don't know if we'd be able to see it, but it's 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 so small, it's it's just very, very micro. I don't think we can get that close on it, but but anyways, the loudest one I've ever heard was kind of just like a faint bee buzzing. I mean you can barely hear it, but I've found hundreds of dusky pygmies, um, Carolina pygmies in the wild. And I'll tell you, they're, they're active, especially down here in the south and southeast. They're active pretty much all year round. During the cooler months, you'll find them out on warmer days. They'll come out and bask and retreat back to a stump hole or, or to their little hideaway to keep, you know, warm during the cold nights. But Florida, this snake is abundant. They're everywhere. In South Carolina, they're abundant. But let me tell you, bites from this guy are never fatal. Even though painful as can be, I mean, they are very painful, swelling, nauseous. I mean, it, it, you'll feel like you want to die if you get bit by one. I know several people that have been bitten by pygmies, and I'll tell you, they were like, oh, worst experience ever. Felt like someone was holding my hand over a hot stove, you know. And antivenom is rarely, rarely given for a pygmy bite because they're such a small yield. And... It's such a minute bite that it doesn't require an antivenom intervention. But serious cases have happened where they've been administered antivenom, which there are a few antivenoms that work. Crofab works. Um, but let me tell you, there's been no recorded deaths from a pygmy rattlesnake. Not that I'm aware of. And I've been studying this for quite a while, and I have not found one yet. If there is, somebody leave me in the comments and let me know. But... The thing is that they are quick to bite. They are cheeky little boogers. They will bite you in a heartbeat. If you fool with them, they're gonna pop you, okay? And you don't wanna get bit by anything venomous. Even though it's not life-threatening, it's still very painful. And what makes the bite so painful, these little boogers? They are a hemotoxic venom. And their fangs are small, and the yields are so small, the amount of venom that they're giving, but it being a hemotoxic venom, you know, let me explain to you what a hemotoxic venom really does. It attacks your red blood cells, okay? And what it does is it disrupts blood from clotting and it can actually cause some tissue damage in certain areas, but this venom is very 
unusual with the small protein in it that it, it, I think it's like 45 to 80 something amino acids in length, but we call it a disintegrin. Okay, we call that disintegrin barberin. It's kind of neat because it's the, you know, Cystaurus malarius barberi. And that makes this guy medically significant. It's actually in an FDA approved drug. And this drug helps blood clotting and some kind of things. And I mean, it's actually even used in surgical procedures when they're applying stents into into heart patients and things like that. It's really neat stuff and it makes this little pygmy rattlesnake medically significant. It plays an important role in stopping blood platelets from aggregating together and forming blood clots. I mean, it's really neat stuff that they figured this out, but it makes this little booger pretty important, you know? So the pygmy rattlesnake, if you know anybody who's had a heart attack and had a heart stents put in, they just may have used that drug that's derived from the pygmy rattlesnake. So, kind of neat, right? It, it's fascinating. It's called Integralin. And it's, it, there's actually another drug that's, that, that's made from the soft scale wiper that does a very similar thing. But, you know, anything hemotoxic that can help with, you know, stopping them red blood cells from aggregating and, and literally causing blood clots and things like that. And that's everything that's been put into use using the pygmy rattlesnake. I mean, how cool is that, right? And who knows what else will be found in the future out of our little pygmy rattlesnakes, you know? So interesting stuff. So the next time you see one crossing the road, you might want to hit the brakes <laughs> and go around it <laughs> because these little guys are nature's drugstore. So the pygmy rattlesnake, what a cool little guy, right? I mean, we love pygmies. I mean, I love the obscure stuff, the little tiny stuff that nobody likes to fool with. That's why, <laughs> that's why I studied him for so many years. But this is a special one. This one, he's hybridized with that Strekeri and Barbari, and he's got some really pretty little colors on him. But the pygmies here in South Carolina, plentiful as they may be, not a threat to, to, um, to the human population, say it's like the copperhead is. Uh, copperheads are everywhere and they bite a bunch of people. Pygmy bites are rare, but they do happen from time to time. So, the pygmy rattlesnake. What a fascinating little creature, right? Ours just happens to be a little grumpy one, and I gotta be really careful because this little sucker bites you in a heartbeat. But he's a little ambassador here at the Serpent Center. We use him to train our first responders and, and school children and things of that nature. And, on identification and, and how just this little harmless looking snake can put you in a world of hurt, okay? <laughs> but we're gonna move on to the coral snake next, y'all. Okay guys, coral snakes, right? We all know what a coral snake is. I mean, even if you're not a snake person, you've heard of a coral snake. I mean, it's the pretty one, it looks like a candy cane. We do have coral snakes here in South Carolina and I don't have a coral snake to show you. And there's a reason for that. We don't keep coral snakes because they are pretty much burrowers. They're not a good exhibit animal. Um, I did have one for several years and I used it for my first responder training. Keeping coral snakes is an art and mine was given to me by a buddy of mine, Chris, and this one would just eat frozen thawed snakes. It would eat frozen thawed anoles. And I monkeyed with that snake long enough where I got it eating frozen thawed pinkies. We have three species of coral snake here in the U.S. We've got the eastern coral snake, which is the one that resides here in South Carolina. And we also have the Texas coral snake and the Sonoran coral snake. Now, coral snakes are a small fossorial species, which means they generally spend a lot of their time like just below the surface of the ground. They're burrowers. They like to be under stuff and, you know, they generally pretty much buried all the time, you know, unless they're out hunting at night. And in my years of herping in the wild, I've only ever seen two. I've only ever seen two coral snakes. One was a D.O.R. was dead on the road. And the other I found under an old stump that I rolled over and it was buried up under an old stump. And it was just a little squirt like this big. The biggest one I ever seen was probably 30 inches, but the average is you know, maybe 18, 20 inches can, can be a, a sexually mature adult. And another interesting fact about, about coral snakes is that literally you don't see them in the venomous hobby too much or, or, or with keepers because they're, they're difficult to keep. They're, they're ophidious. They're, <laughs> they're 
there goes the biker boys. <laughs> They're definitely open. Wait till I get my bike off, start tearing these roads up. They're gonna really hear a motorcycle when I bust when I bust the fire bike out. <laughs> Anyways, they are definitely ophidious. I mean, which means they eat other snakes. They are a specialized predator. They eat smaller snakes. And I have seen them eat an owls and eat other reptilian fare, but they're specialized. They like to eat other snakes. And actually, our little pygmy rattlesnake, we saved his butt, okay? Because my buddy Chris had them little pygmies born, and he's the coral snake guy. He was like, I'm just going to feed him to my feed them to my corals. I go, nah, you give me a couple of them. <laughs> he was just going to feed them off. But, um, so we rescued that little guy. <laughs> he was about to be eaten by a coral snake. They're all fitty, so they're hard to keep. They, they, they really are, unless you got a good supply of snakes and you get them to eat. Getting them to eat is a pain in the butt. And that's why it's, it, it's really not a commonly kept species. With coral snakes, the main thing is their color, you know, is the banding and the mimicry. And it's often mistaken for other snakes because there are two mimicries that look just like a coral snake. Y'all heard that little rhyme, right? Red touch yellow kill a fellow, right? That's the coral snake. Red touch black venom lack, okay? But we have the scarlet king snake, which is very, very similar to a coral snake. And especially if you see one moving, you're not gonna decipher what it is while it's moving because them colors are flying and all you see is red and light colors banding together. And then we have the scarlet snake, which is very similar also. So there's a lot of mistakes made. People don't know how to decipher, like say a scarlet snake from a scarlet king snake. And if you see one in the wild on the move, you're definitely not gonna decipher if it's a coral snake or a scarlet king snake or a scarlet snake, okay? Because I can't do it. When they're moving, they're moving. You can't tell what the hell they are, okay? Another interesting fact is that the coral snake is our only venomous snake here that is a true lapid. It's not a pit viper. All the other venomous snakes in the U.S. are pit vipers. The coral snake isn't a lapid. He's in the cobra family, and he has a very toxic, neurotoxic venom. And documented deaths, I mean, um, there, there was one in 2009, but there wasn't one recorded in like 40 years. So that's a long time. Coral snake bites, on the other hand, can be serious. If you ever do get accidentally bitten by a coral snake, you seek medical attention immediately. A lot of people think, well, there is no anti-venom for coral snakes, and that's just not true. There is anti-venom being made for coral snakes. There was a company, Wyeth, was making anti-venom for coral snakes. They actually were bought by Pfizer. This is actually antivenom right here, okay? And this isn't coral snake antivenom. This one is, um, is day. This was a good product back in the day. And that's just what your little antivenom kit looks like, okay? So you have your live flies, antivenom right here. And I've got a bunch of these. I used to have a pretty good stock of Wyeth. And uh, it's so outdated, it's, it can't be used, but I've been keeping antivenom so long. This, this stuff's over 20 something years old. It's live flies, antivenom, look, it, it's still, Still in good shape, you know, seal's never been broke, but that's what a little anti-venom kit looks like. You know, you got your solution, you got your lifelized venom, you got everything you need. This company was producing anti-venom for coral snakes. And when Wyeth went out of business, I believe Pfizer bought them. But the problem was they couldn't find enough, uh, enough extractors to be willing to work with the coral snakes because they give such a minute amount of venom and it's such an, a massive amount of work to produce a little bit of venom. They asked the FDA to go ahead and extend the expiration date on that old anti-venom. Pfizer actually contacted a few talented extractors that were willing to take on this task of producing coral snake venom. Coral snakes ain't easy to keep. I mean, they're, they're a pain in the butt and it's real art keeping coral snakes. If you can get them eating, great. Sometimes they don't eat and they gotta be force fed. They gotta be, it, 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 it's not easy to keep coral snakes. And I've had them and got lucky with them, but I'm gonna tell you, they're, they're a pain in the butt. Now, since 2019, there's, there's product being made. But the problem is a lot of hospitals, a lot of medical institutions, they won't keep it in stock. They won't keep that antivenom in stock because it's expensive and it's rarely ever used because bites are so rare. Florida, there's more bites because there's probably more coral snakes. Some places will keep it. A lot of places don't. So that's the problem. 
They said, well, we don't have the antibound for them. It's not because it doesn't exist. It's because they won't spend the money to keep it on hand because it has an expiration date. It's out there. You just got nowhere to get it. But bites are serious. We're not talking about a hemotoxic venom. We're talking about a neurotoxic venom. A venom that can literally do some damage. Most people bitten by a coral snake, they think that they were not envenomated. They literally, you know, it's just a, a, such a small bite. They need to chew a little bit. They need to grab a hold of you pretty good to envenomate you. Let me, because their heads are so small. A lot of people have been bitten by a coral snake. They don't feel the effects till eight to 10 hours later. Then they figure out, wait a minute, I don't feel right. Something's going wrong. And that's how long it takes for that little minute amount of venom to work into their system and start destroying things. Okay. The coral snake is often mistaken for its mimicries. And the thing is, the only rhyme you need to know, the truth is like, a snake is a snake, don't touch a snake. Okay? <laughs> that's it. And the problem is, most people bitten by a coral snake are children. They see something bright, colorful, and pretty moving around. They immediately want to pick it up, okay? Or a herper have an, accident, an accidental bite or something, you know? But honestly, bites are usually with children. And so to save children's lives, like Carl and Jack and these guys decided to take on this task, this daunting task of extracting coral snake venom. And the only time you'll probably ever encounter a coral snake is maybe a, a rainy summer night or if you're digging somewhere in your backyard and rolling dead logs and doing some clearing, then you might encounter a coral snake. I've found them crossing the road at night, Florida, Georgia, and South Carolina. But South Carolina, I've only seen two. Only seen two in many, many years. So it's a very secretive snake. They're beautiful, neat animal. There's so much we need to learn. Okay, y'all, I hope you enjoyed this video. This Truly an educational one. I want to just kind of give everybody some little tidbits on the pygmy rattlesnake and the coral snake. But y'all probably thinking, hey, when's you going to get back to the fangs in your face? We want to see some slow-mos. <laughs> this is actually, this time is, is my law in feeding a lot of our stuff because it's the cooler temperatures. We're just getting ready for the onset of spring and I'll start feeding again. So we'll get back to some of your normal programming here soon. <laughs> and we've also been working day and night on the Serpentarium. And it's, we've taken on a pretty big task with just the wife and I to do all this work ourselves. And we could use a team, but uh, we are the team. We're the home team. <laughs> and hey, we got a new shirt out. We got the Bushmaster shirt out. And if you can't have a Bushmaster, you might as well have a shirt, right? <laughs> Help support the Serpent Center. Buy a Bushmaster shirt. Everybody's been asking for a Bushmaster shirt. So there it is, y'all. Grab one up. I'd have mine on, but I don't get mine until tomorrow. I have to pay for my own, too. So <laughs> we get it mailed in tomorrow. But hey, if you're new to the channel, hit that V logo thing and subscribe now and come on back and check us out at the Serpent Center here at Don Central for some truly educational content. This is Willie. We're checking out. Later.